core audit process. So the complete audit process can be divided into five phases. First is initial phase, then we have planning phase, then we have execution phase, after execution we have reporting phase and finally we have some other points. So let's discuss first initial phase. So imagine client comes and offers audit. So at reception we ask two things, preconditions, basic conditions. Number one, are you ready to give it in writing that it is your responsibility to prepare financial statements? And number two, whether applicable financial reporting framework, framework which you are following is acceptable, is of good quality. If two conditions are fulfilled, we ask him to sit down. And then we ask one more, one more thing. Are you planning to put any limitations, that means restrictions, any limitation on scope, that means restrictions, on what we are going to check and how we are going to check things. He says, no, we are not planning to put any limitation on scope. We are not planning to put any restrictions of what kind of checking you are going to do. So we ask him, okay, you can go and meet the CA. So he comes and sits in front of the CA. CA says that we will perform preliminary engagement activities and we will perform three things in this. Number one, number one, We will first take all the information, we will, we will, we will first take all the information and we will think carefully whether to accept the new assignment and whether to continue the old assignment. And if we think it is appropriate, next we will think what steps will be required to ensure that we remain ethical and independent throughout the audit, like keeping relatives away, etc. Finally, when these two things are done, third, we will sign an engagement letter will make an engagement letter. So moment we make an engagement letter, initial phase is over. Then next is we start the planning phase. In planning, first document which is prepared, first document which is prepared that is called as audit strategy. Audit strategy. So it is broad, so it is broad guidelines with respect to what should be done, what should be done and what should not be done. Then on the base of audit strategy, next thing which is prepared is audit plan. So it, audit plan is detailed instruction how audit should be conducted. And both these things are updated on regular basis as per new information. The first plan we make is plan of risk assessment procedure. Now what do you mean by risk assessment procedure? It simply means collecting information, collecting information and obtaining understanding so that so that on this basis we can identify the risk, perform the next step. Next step is identify and assessing the risk. From the information which we got, we think what can go wrong and what would be the level of risk. Is it a high level risk, medium level risk, low, uh, low level risk or is it a financial statement level risk or a assertion level risk. So this is called identify and assessing the risk. So we collect information in risk assessment procedure and we think what can go wrong and what is the level of the risk, nature of the risk in identifying and assessing the risk. Risk is divided into two levels, financial statement level and assertion level. Okay. Uh, now, if we have risk in, of such a manner that uh, misstatement can happen in any part of the financial statement, it is called financial statement level risk. That means shifting from years to India's uh, software, accounting software is not appropriate, accounts head is not that knowledgeable management has integrity issues, anywhere things can go wrong, that is a financial statement level risk. And when, when we know exactly in this financial item, this particular point things will go wrong, that is called assertion level risk. We will discuss assertion after some time. Now, so moment we decide that there are two, moment we decide that there are two levels of risk, two levels of risk, risk at financial statement level, risk at assertion level, okay. then. Once we get this risk, we go for the next phase, execution phase. Now, for financial statement level risk, we have overall response. We have overall response. Now, what is the overall response? Making team bigger, more seniors, more expert, uh, asking team to remain more alert, increasing the level of professional skepticism, increasing surprise checking. That is called overall response. 
Now, when we know that risk is in particular financial item, particular point, that is called as assertion level risk. We plan further audit procedures. Further audit procedure is going to include two things. It is going to include two things. It is going to include two things. That is test of controls and substantive test of controls and substantive procedures. Now, what is test of control? When we go and focus and examine whether procedures which are framed, procedures, procedures which are framed by management, are they able to, are they, when we go and check internal control systems, are they designed properly, are they operating effectively, that is called test of controls. Test of control is an intermediary step. If controls are good, we will have to do less checking ahead. If controls are bad, we will have to do more checking ahead. The ultimate step is substantive procedure. To substantive procedure means to substantiate. So there are two ways of substantiating. There are two ways of substantiating transaction balances and disclosure in financial statements. There are two ways of checking financial data. One is to sit in the air condition chamber and do a lot of comparison. Compare data and ratios with the previous year with others. That is called analytical procedures. Substantive analytical procedures. Then go go to the offices go to the audit place and there you start doing inquiry then the next is test of details that means doing inquiry or inspection of the documents or recomputation recalculation and so on that is called test of details we cannot perform test of details on everything so we go for sampling when we check income and expenditure from supporting documents it is called vouching because we are checking it from voucher the purpose of voucher is that people should be able to check transaction with the help of that supporting document. That is vouching. When we check asset and liability, it is called as verification. By performing these procedures, we try to collect sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. We are very intelligent. We take help of others. When we take help of, help of another auditor, that is branch auditor, SA6 scenario is applicable. We can take help of internal auditor in 610. We can take help of expert in 620. Finally, the last evidence we collect is SA 580 written representation. So we keep, we take all the, we take all the important things which management has, which management has said, which management has done in writing. So tomorrow, so tomorrow they should not run away from the responsibility. So we take a written representation from them. After getting all the evidence, we finally understand whether there are material, whether there are misstatements. If there are, if there are misstatements. We rectify them as per SA 450. Finally, next once rectification, uh, once we ask management to rectify, next step is reporting. Depending on whether management has rectified the misstatements or not, we draft opinion. We frame opinion draft report. Then we ensure that engagement quality control review is over. Before signing, ensure that quality control review is over and then finally report is signed. Reporting phase is over, but the work is not done. Once reporting is done, all the files are collected, are, the, are collated, documents are sorted, they are indexed, uh, they are indexed, they are completed and they are kept systematically. That is called documentation. Documentation, once everything is done on regular basis, system is analyzed, system is studied, that is monitoring and completed assignments are checked, that is called inspection. Now, what do you mean by assertion? A very simple meaning, a very simple, a very simple, a very simple meaning of a very simple meaning of assertion means to say something with confidence. When we when we say something, when we say something with a lot of confidence, that is called firmly, that is called assertion. They are also called management assertions. So financial statements are prepared by management. So all the information, all the information given through financial statements, whether directly or indirectly. All the information, all the representation through financial, it is called assertions. This is a broad meaning. So, all the information which we get directly, indirectly from financial statement is assertion. Now, for specific meaning, there are three types of data. Three types of data, transactions, transactions, balances and disclosure, TBD. So, there are three types of data and there is a specific meaning. There are three types of, type of data and and uh, and, there, and there is a specific meaning to it. Let's see. So, when we talk about transactions, 
when we talk when we talk when we talk about transactions transaction means income expenses cash inflows outflows balances mean assets and liabilities disclosure means notes to accounts now let's see suppose we have land and building of 100 crores now directly indirectly what information we are getting that this is real land building Exi it is really it is there existence no land building flat plot is left out completeness amount is appropriate valuation it is written our balance sheet that means we are the owner rights and obligation so these are the four assertions of assets and liabilities then pnl sale is 1000 crore sales 1000 crore what it says that this is a real sale it has occurred so occurrence now no sale is left out completeness amount is appropriate accuracy it is properly classified capital or versus revenue and revenue proper department and proper product so classification then sale of current year has not gone to next year next year sale has not come to current year that is called cutoff classification cutoff so in balance sheet there is one special that is rights and obligation here two special classification cutoff and then assertions of assertions of notes to accounts are on same lines similar lines then we started with the chapter chapter number 2 so initially there was a very simple case that a chart account is doing audit and now a lot of allegations are there on the client a lot of complaints a lot of complaints are made on the client so there are indications of non compliance of law where asset 250 needs to be applied and it is it is apparent that uh, maybe client is involved in fraudulent activity so asset 240 is also applicable so this is a very simple situation where asset 240 is applicable asset 250 is applicable and so on so this particular chapter is about uh, general principles governing the audit is is majorly on the 200 series now the most important message which asset 200 gave us was the overall objective overall objective is to give opinion whether financial statements those 50 60 100 200 pages are they prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework and if it is a fair presentation framework fair presentation framework then we additionally have to tell whether financial statements whether financial statements give true and fair view so give this to frame to frame this opinion we go and check all the material items uh, are they and are with reasonable assurance we obtain reasonable assurance are they free from material misstatement and then finally we make a report so this is ultimate objective is to give open on financial statements for that we do examination and then we make report so we are going to study asset 240 250 260 290 and 402 now what is the ultimate objective asset 240 ultimate objective is pretty simple it says that it's auditor's responsibility to go and identify risk of material misstatement between fraud so go and find out identify and assess fraud risk once you get fraud risk, perform audit design and perform audit procedures to get sufficient appropriate evidence. Once you get audit evidence, then, uh, then finally find out whether there is a fraud or suspected fraud. And if there is a fraud or suspected fraud, then respond, uh, respond appropriately. Respond appropriately. You may have to, you may have to report about the fraud. Uh, you have to report about the fraud in audit report and to authorities, etc. So that is the ultimate target set for the auditor. So what do you mean by fraud? When management or TCWG or employees or any third person intentionally deceives to extract unjustified benefit. Right? unjustified benefit now that is called as fraud so trying to fool others to get unjust benefit that is fraud as an auditor we are interested only in those frauds which are having material misstatement impact on the financial statement not all the frauds frauds can be of two types it can be fraudulent financial fraudulent financial reporting when you intentionally when you intentionally adjust financial statements intentionally adjust financial statements to deceive users that is fraudulent financial reporting or misappropriation of assets when you when you steal or use business assets for personal purpose that is uh, misappropriation of assets now very interesting there are three things involved that is fraud risk factors fraud risk and fraud 
Now what are they? Anything, anything which, uh, anything which uh, can become reason, anything because of which, anything because of which frauds can happen, that is fraud risk factors. One or more fraud risk factors can increase probability of fraud and it can become fraud risk. And once we go and examine things for fraud risk, we may get the fraud. So fraud risk factors are those small clues with the help of which we will get fraud risk. And from fraud risk, ultimately we will reach the fraud. So there are three types of fraud risk or three types of reasons because of which fraud happen. And there is power, pressure. If there is a pressure, pressure on people, pressure on uh, people to have better financial results, to better financial statements, or there are incentives, they will earn a lot of money because of uh, incentives, then it can, they, it can lead to fraud because of opportunity. And because of opportunity, because uh, something is very easy to do, very easy to do, people may go for fraud because of attitude, poor, uh, poor, unethical values, because of because of unethical attitude and rationalization. Because of that also fraud may happen. So it can happen because of pressure. It can happen because of poor, bad attitude, unethical values. It can happen because of opportunity. Now, let's understand fraudulent financial reporting. So when intentionally financial statements are misstated to deceive the users of financial statement, that's called fraudulent financial reporting. This is also called window dressing. Generally, it starts as a minor adjustments and then it becomes a complete full-fledged fraudulent financial reporting. Top level management who are most experienced, more powerful, they are involved in this. Generally, it is accomplished by three ways. OMR, omissions. So, a lot of uh, important information in notes to accounts, balance sheet PNL can be omitted like revaluation information, bonus information, charge on the property information, litigation, content liability can be omitted. There can be misrepresentation. Loan received can be shown as revenue. Loan uh, given can be shown as expense and so on. Omissions can be there. Omissions and misrepresentation. There can be misapplication of accounting principles. Purposefully, misapplication may happen. So, finance lease may be shown as operating lease. Misapplication. Then, purposefully, uh, purposefully, uh, revenue nature expenditure treated as capital expenditure misapplication then record tampering so basic documents can be uh, can be tampered can be altered basic documents can be basic documents can be altered to show that revenue expenditure is a capital expenditure it can be altered sales contract can be altered to record revenue early and more revenue recognition then these are the techniques. So these are again techniques of implementing OMR. So implementing and it generally involves management override of internal control systems where internal controls are broken and bypassed. So the shortcut is NALAIC uses fraud card. N stands for not disclosing facts is one of the technique of FFR. Fictitious journal entries, fake journal entries is one of the techniques. Then fraud card complex going for complex transaction no one is able to understand what's happening and doing wrong accounting misapplication of accounting principle is one of the way then adjustments to assumptions adjusting assumptions adjusting as adjusting as adjusting assumptions making judgments adjusting assumptions to increase profits that is one of the technique recording record alterations Okay, so again, same examples, changing the records for manipulation, timing adjustment, pushing expenses, delaying expenses of current year, pushing it to next year, advancing income of next year to current year, is again, one of the way of techniques of fraudulent financial reporting. Then, misappropriation of assets. So, when theft of the asset or use of the asset for personal purpose involved, that's called misappropriation. So, we change a little bit of the numbering. So it can involve theft, stealing the assets, it can be cash, stock, any other asset or using it for personal purpose, not giving the benefits of the asset to the organization, to the company. That is the way of doing it. So explain misappropriation, explain the two ways. Then this can be done at the time of, this can be done through receipt and embezzlement. 
So when money is received, that time, uh, that time it can be, that money can be siphoned off, that money can be stolen. Don't make the bills, don't make the bills, that money can be stolen. Make the bill, later on show the discount, amount of discount can be stolen. Make one bill and have collect multiple amounts on the basis of that, again money is stolen. Then payment side, uh, paying for the fake expenses, that's a fraud. Paying extra, that's the fraud. Giving, uh, giving, making, uh, making more payments to the, making more payments to the supplier in the name of interest and other things. Again, that's a fraud. So generally this is concealed. People conceal this. People conceal this. So people, so people conceal, people conceal these frauds by, so stock is stolen and it is shown as obsolete. Stock is shown as obsolete. Stock is stolen and uh, there is shown as normal loss and so on. So auditor's role is to ca catch hold of these frauds. Then whose responsibility is that? So to prevent, to prevent frauds from happening, to deter, discourage people from, from doing fraud, it is responsibility of management to have that culture of honesty or to, have, or to have that fear of punishment and action, prevention and deterrence, discouragement of fraud is responsibility of management and TCWG. To detect and correct, detect and correct frauds is also responsibility of the management. Then what is the responsibility of the auditor? Simply go with the oral objective. Whether financial statements are as per applicable financial reporting framework, whether they give true and fair view. To with, to, for this, go and check all material items. Are they free from material misstatement? Maybe because of fraud or error. So that is our objective. That is our responsibility. That is the ultimate objective of the audit, ultimate responsibility of the auditor. Along with that, we remain professional. We show professional skepticism. We remain alert throughout the audit. We remain alert throughout the audit. We, we, uh, we remain alert throughout the audit. We ask a lot of questions. We remain alert. We ask a lot of questions. A uh, lot of questions. We do critical analysis, critical analysis of the evidence and information given to us. So this will definitely help to catch more frauds, to detect more frauds. Now, why so? Why our responsibility is limited? Why we give, we, we talk about reasonable assurance, not guarantee. Why we talk about only material frauds and not all the frauds? There are the six reasons. Intelligent frauds by C CM and JP. First of all, inherent limitations. There are so many inherent limitations in the audit process. We have limited time, cost and power. We are, we are heavily dependent on the management. So we cannot take responsibility to detect all the frauds. Fraud detection is very, very tricky, very complicated, very difficult as compared to error. Then the concealment, there are various ways of concealing what wrong has been done. There can be fake documents, fake, PA, fake uh, uh, information by people and fake transaction trail, everything. Management fraud, management level people can be involved. They can override controls anytime they want. A lot of judgment areas are there. In judgment areas, it's difficult to tell whether a judgment is fraudulently adjusted or there is a real adjustment. Perpetrator can be very smart and intelligent. So all because of the, all these reasons, our responsibility with respect to fraud is limited. We will give efforts, but our responsibility will be limited. Then fraud risk factors, we already know. Pressures, pressure, attitude, opportunity, they are the reasons. They are the root causes of the fraud. They can lead to fraud. So we should be, we should be always alert whether such first fraud risk factors are there. See, there are six set of examples. So uh, examples of fraud risk factors, example of, uh, example of pressures, in FFR, examples of uh, attitude in FFR, example of opportunity in FFR, then example of pressure, attitude, opportunity in misappropriation of asset. Let's first see examples. Let's just see examples, uh, examples of fraud risk factors. Examples of fraud risk, uh, examples of, uh, uh, examples of pressure. Examples of pressure in fraudulent financial reporting. So, pressure or incentive. So, if there is any situation which is threatening, which is putting pressure on the profitability or fin financial profitability, financial pro financial profitability or financial stability, 
फाइनेंशियल फाइनेंशियल प्रॉफिट फाइनेंशियल प्रॉफिटेबिलिटी फाइनेंशियल प्रॉफिटेबिलिटी और फाइनेंशियल स्टेबिलिटी ओके फाइनेंशियल प्रॉफिट फाइनेंशियल प्रॉफिट फाइनेंशियल प्रॉफिटेबिलिटी और फाइनेंशियल स्टेबिलिटी और फाइनेंशियल स्टेबिलिटी ऑफ द कंपनी देन ऑफ द कंपनी देन दीज आर दीज आर फ्रॉड रिस्क दीज आर दीज दीज आर फ्रॉड रिस्क फैक्टर्स बिकॉज ऑफ विच Fraudulent financial reporting may happen. FFR may happen. So, company has fraud circuit. So, if there is lot of competition and pressure on the profits, it can lead to FFR. If there is operating losses, operating losses, there is a chance of bankruptcy or uh, bankruptcy or uh, takeover. Okay, takeover of the comp hostile takeover of the company. People may look. People may go for FFR to protect themselves. If there is a declining customer demand. decreasing revenue again people may go for fr if the interest rates are rising if the interest rates rates are rising again they will go for ffr because of regulatory changes because of regulatory changes again there can be pressure on uh, pressure on the profitability people may go for ffr if their cash flows issues cash flows is not getting generated to hide this people may go for ffr unusual growth and profitability we are not getting proper growth and profitability which we are expecting people may go for ffr technological changes are putting pressure either increasing costs change of technology is increasing cost it can go people may go for ffr because of management and third party expectations so lift people want lift that's why ffr can happen listing to achieve listing requirements people may go for ffr because of investor pressure uh, people may go for ffr because of financing needs because of because of financing needs they want money badly people may go for ffr because of transaction there is a pending amalgamation merger demerger for favorable terms people may go for ffr for to improve personal financial situation pf square then so performance based there is a performance based compensation people may go for ffr for performance based compensation for personal to protect themselves from uh personal guarantee be getting triggered they may go for ffr for financial interest they have heavy investment in shares to increase their share value people may go for ffr to achieve financial targets people may go for ffr then example of the poor attitude example of poor attitude or rationalization example of poor attitude or rationalization because of which people may go for ffr fila financial manipulation so the top, so top management believes financial management is part and parcel their pressure they are uh, part and parcel and they want stock prices to increase they want earnings to increase asset value to increase they want unrealistic growth so so they they feel man, financial manipulation is absolutely fine it is part and parcel if that is the that is that is poor attitude and rationalization people may go for ffr ineffective communication ethical values are not properly defined and communicated and people are not trained because of that people can have poor attitude poor attitude and rationalization management issues they are not they are not rectifying internal control deficiencies deficiencies in internal controls so that so that we can find out what is the truth what is the level of the misstatement and it can be rectified purposefully purposefully they are not rectifying it okay then there is a history of legal violation there is a history there is a history of legal violation which shows poor attitude and rationalization non non financial management people are taking keen interest in the accounting process accounting policies and estimates and pressurizing to do take particular set of assumptions and policies to increase profits again this shows poor attitude and rationalization relationship between management and auditor is strained is strained because of fraud there is a shortcut for there are frequent disputes there are lot of restrictions on the auditor there is unreasonable demand with respect to time and fees management is trying to dominating management deciding what procedure need to be applied how much evidence should be taken what should be done next what should kind of reporting should be there all these things shows that they are trying there is a poor relation that shows that management is having poor attitude and rationalization and they are trying to hide something there is a strain they are trying to hide something again this can lead to fraud examples 
of opportunity examples of opportunity ec gives rjd opportunity there are a lot of estimates in financial statement there are a lot of complex transactions and situation financial statement a lot of related party transaction multi jurisdiction uh, our branches and company subsidiaries are ac across countries in tax havens multi jurisdiction entities and transactions dominance in the market all these are all these are because of all these things there is a huge opportunity to do fraud huge opportunity to do fraud then monitoring is not effective no one is looking after the people no one is looking only single person or small group if there is no good monitoring over the company people will people will sense the opportunity to do something wrong complex or unstable organizational structure so high turnover if if there is a if there is a high level of turnover if there is high uh, so high turnover people are high turnover over complex organization structure if there is a high turnover of people again it is easy to do it is it gives opportunity to fraud no one knows who did the mistake who did the fraud very complex organization structure people may use this people may use this opportunity to hide and do the fraud difficult to determine who is the real owner so these the hidden owners can do the fraud easily deficient there is a deficiency because of staff staff instability uh, monitoring deficiency system inefficiency all these create more and more opportunity there is no proper staff there is no proper monitoring systems are not efficient there are no proper records all these create opportunity to do fraud examples of pressures which can lead to misappropriation of assets let's see very simple if there are personal financial obligation on the employees of the company uh, on the directors employees management it can lead to misappropriation of asset if there are adverse relationship between management and employees this can happen because of three things lic because of known or anticipated layoffs or inconsistent increase in the compensation bonus there is a mismatch in expectation and actual things or there are aware about changes which will be done for the compensation so these three things layoffs inconsistent mismatches between expectation and reality and changes these can bring adverse relation and employees can go for misappropriation of assets the next is example of attitude issues carelessness because of which misappropriation can happen so management may act very careless they disregard the risk they don't understand they don't consider they do anything about risk they disregard importance and importance importance of internal controls its designing and implementation they don't take care of dissatisfactions employees are dissatisfied but they are not doing anything about it they show tolerance to the theft to the small threats and tomorrow it will become bigger lifestyle changes are happening but they are not paying attention to it not understanding from it so disregard for risk disregard for control dissatisfactions threat tolerances lifestyle changes then example of opportunities which can lead to misappropriation of assets in the sequence of assets in a balance sheet when comes it, fixed assets investments inventory and cash so if there are they are very small in they are, if they are very small easily sell easily movable easily sellable not having identification marks it can be sold easily and fraud can be and misappropriation can be done there is fixed assets or investments easily convertible inventory uh, again very easily sellable large amount of cash where if even if there is some uh, reduction people won't understand so these these create opportunities for misappropriation then if they have designed weak controls there is lack of as for segregation there is lack of segregation of duty there is no appropriate safeguarding of assets there is no management oversight there is no proper authorization system smart is the shortcut there is no proper record keeping of the assets who is accessing them uh, management is not technically technologically sound they don't understand how technology functions and how controls are implemented 
so if these weaknesses are there these weaknesses create opportunity for misappropriation of asset then once we once we know about fraud risk factor so the question is why evaluation of fraud risk factor is so important so first why responsibility auditor is responsible to find out whether financial statements are free from material misstatements whether due to fraud or error with reasonable assurance because material frauds are uh, are the material it is their responsibility to identify with reasonable assurance material frauds they have to look for fraud risk factors looking at fraud risk factor looking at fraud risk factors will help them identify fraud risk these are two principal reasons they should go for fraud risk factors but then understand it may not it is not necessary they will get risk of material misstatement due to fraud risk of material misstatement due to fraud or fraud risk both are same it is not necessary that they will get frauds from this fraud risk factors are difficult to conceal so that's why auditor should go and look for them once you get fraud risk factor we cannot rank them they are simply clues more information need to be obtained and then we need to see whether it is it, it is becoming a fraud risk our only tool is professional skepticism professional skepticism means whenever information document or anything is given to auditor he should be alert he should ask lot of questions and he should critically assess that particular information and evidence that's called professional skepticism two things can happen he may feel that there is nothing which creates suspicion if there is nothing which creates suspicion he can show full faith on the information and the evidence but if he gets suspicion he should increase auditor should increase nature timing extent of audit procedures more audit procedures need to be performed more evidence need to be uh, need to be collected and then we are supposed to conclude whether there is a fraud next collective knowledge is always much bigger than individual knowledge so whenever you come across fraud risk factors fraud risk it should be communicated within the team information opinion of everyone should be collected collected it will make understanding of the fraud risk factors fraud risk fraud better you will be able to design better audit procedures get better audit evidences better audit evidences and better conclusions so go and discuss everything collect their opinion and then go ahead then we say risk assessment procedure risk assessment procedure means collecting information obtaining understanding so that on that basis we can identify and assess risk ittefaq is the shortcut i stand for inquiries go and talk to management go and talk to management what is the result of their risk management process what are the fraud risk they are aware about are there then is suspected or suspected or actual frauds they are aware about go and talk to management talk to management ask about their risk management process ask about suspected actual frauds or allegations then go and talk to tcwg talk to them how they how they have oversight oversight of management's activity how they understand uh, how they understand fraud related systems what is their understanding of risk management by fraud are they aware about risk are they about I any mean, suspected actual fraud or allegations then go and see ittefaq that i internal control evaluation go and see how good are controls if controls are weak then again it will lead to increase in the fraud risk finally once you get all the information evaluate all the information for are there fraud if you evaluate uh, evaluate if if this information indicates fraud risk factors if this information indicates fraud risk factor collect all the information and understand whether this fraud risk factors together are becoming fraud risk finally analytical procedures analytical procedures are nothing but comparisons this comparisons will tell you about the unusual they will they will tell they will tell you about unusual uh, unusual relationships and uh, unusual things which are there in data again you can get a fraud risk with the help of that now you may get uh, fraud risk at financial statement level if there is a fraud risk at financial statement level then make your team strong shortcut is personnel from usa so have more number of employees more number of employees more knowledgeable employees experienced employees skillful employees more experts then have unpredictable nature of audit procedures don't pre inform who is going to perform audit procedure what areas will be checked how they will be checked details don't give them time to manipulate things then go for more supervision go for additional supervision 
and then spend special time analyzing accounting policies. Accounting policies may be designed to execute fraud, fraudulent financial reporting, analyze them in depth that can lead to big consequences, especially when it comes to research expenditures, capital expenditures or uh, controversial accounting treatments. Then what if there is a risk at assertion level? If there is a risk at assertion level, then design and perform audit procedures for that particular assertion. Go for test of controls for that assertion, substantive procedures, test of details for that assertion. Basically, go and increase audit procedures. Go and increase audit procedures for uh, for those for those assertions. Okay. Let's understand. Let's understand. So. Uh, if there is, suppose we came to know that there is a pressure on the management to increase the sales revenue. So, there is a chances that sales revenue is inflated, sales revenue is fake. So, what to do? Increase audit procedures. Spend more time analyzing the sales agreement. Go for external confirmations. Go and check test of controls. Are they having, first go and check test of controls. Are they having good controls to protect the occurrence, to ensure that sales are not fake? Then go for... Uh, agreement understanding external confirmation go and talk to non-finance non-finance employees they may give you a lot of important information then next is audit procedures for management override each and every audit always has some risk of management override irrespective of what organization there's always risk of management override so auditors are it is mandatory it is mandatory for auditors it is mandatory for auditor it is mandatory mandatory for auditors to design design audit procedures to design okay to design audit procedures for management override especially three areas j4 journal entries which are passed at the year end special audit process for that then for accounting estimates and understanding whether management is biased in making accounting estimates are they having hidden agenda then special audit process then audit process for oncb outside normal course of business whether these things are apart from that there can be additional audit procedures also additional audit procedures for management override then evaluating audit evidence that's very important whenever you get information evidence study it analyze it and think first whether it indicates fraud risk risk of material misstatement of fraud then next thing uh, next thing is there a misstatement if there's a misstatement then think is it intentional is it is it intentional is it indicating fraud if it is indicating fraud, then next thing, whether top level of management is involved, management fraud is there, then think whether collusion of employees with management or third parties is involved. And finally, confirm the fraud. This next thing, think about it. Are we confirming the fraud? If the fraud is if the fraud is confirmed, then it will have implications on or uh, implications on audit report and implications on reporting. Then exceptional circumstances exceptional circumstances very simple if you get a situation of suspect or actual fraud and management is not cooperating there are threats to you that's called exceptional circumstances then next step is think about reporting am i supposed to inform to government or regulatory authorities or tcwg uh, regulatory authorities holding company to whom i'm supposed to inform about it go and inform about these frauds or suspected frauds the next sit and decide have you are you losing trust on the management if you're losing trust of the management the overall management integrity of the management you can think about withdrawal if you have finalized withdrawal go and explain the reasons to to management tcwg why you are withdrawing and finally report about withdrawing to government to ROC, to uh, to roc to to roc to company to cag as required by law rules and regulations so there are two things there are two things what to do if there, uh, that if there are exceptional circumstances you go for reporting and then next is go for reporting and then next is it's all about discussion about withdrawal how to take decisions how to communicate and how to how to explain and then how to report then we talk about management representation you should take prada prada from the management p stand for prevention so first we want management to write down it is their responsibility to design and implement internal control system for prevention, detection, and correction, correction of uh, correction of material of uh, misstatements due to fraud. It is their responsibility to prevent, detect, and correct frauds. Then R stand for 
the so they should give it in writing to us that it is their responsibility to perform risk assessment procedures and they have shared all the information all the results of risk assessment procedures with respect to frauds nothing is hidden the next they have shared all the information of uh, allegations all the information of allegations by third parties by government by media by employees customers which talk about frauds they have disclosed they have made all the disclosures about the frauds and suspected frauds as uh, suspected frauds especially where uh, big frauds where material misstatement is involved number one or where management is involved number two or third where employees with significant role in internal control are involved so we want a written representation from them confirming these things let's talk about communication let's talk about communication all the fraud should all the fraud should be communicated to management management should be informed about all the fraud with details on timely basis then communication to tcwg if tcwg is different from management they are different then we should go and communicate them we should communicate big frauds all the frauds which leads to material misstatements all the fraud where management is involved all the fraud where employees are employees with significant role are involved in managing internal control system then if it's management fraud go and inform about nature time extent of the audit procedures because it is that that is that important that severe apart from this if there is any fraud which is going to help tcwg in improving their oversight in improving their oversight uh, oversight then that should be communicated then next is regulatory regulatory and enforcement authorities see first of all it is responsibility of the auditor to sit and decide is he supposed to inform to regulatory authority he need to consider all the law rules and regulations which are applicable study it now the criteria will be what law says and what how to protect confidentiality is there breach of confidentiality so there is a responsibility to decide for deciding he has to see law he has to see confidentiality further if there is no correction that becomes the big reason he should go and communicate if there is no correction it is a big reason it is a big reason that he should go and communicate about it if there is a audit mandate if terms of engagement or uh, instruction from authorities then he is supposed to communicate okay so he has to decide and he should consider these three things when he is taking decisions now what needs to be documented all the risk of material misstatements identified all the fraud risks all the fraud risk identified during the course of audit should be documented all the responses to risk that is audit procedures for financial statement risk for assertion level risk for management override risk should be documented all the results obtained from these procedures response risk should be documented then all the communications made communication to management communication to tcwg communication to regulatory authorities need to be documented finally we see a very important thing there is standard presumption that there is a standard presumption that there will be fraud risk in revenue recognition it will be always presumed now if operations are very simple very simple there are no complexities very simple business operations there are no indicated no indication of fraud risk then we can rebut then we can rebut avoid ignore the standard presumption and if we are rebuting it these need to be documented carefully sa250 so let's start with let's take introduction later on okay let's first start with responsibility of management so the variety of different laws are applicable to organization what is responsibility of management with respect to that first of all to ensure that there is a complete compliance with law rules and regulations to prevent non compliances to detect non compliances to rectify them it is responsibility of the management the next to establish for this to establish code of this the code of conduct to establish code of conduct having rules and responsibilities what should be done it is their responsibility after making code of conduct to train employees of the legal department how to apply that code of conduct that is their responsibility then after that monitoring appointing knowledgeable skillful people legal advisors who keep monitoring whether entity systems are ensuring proper compliance with uh, ensuring proper compliance with law rules and regulation okay it is their responsibility small entities go for legal advisors when it comes to large entities listed companies they give this responsibility to they give this responsibility to audit committees 
audit committees or intern auditors or there can be separate compliance officer and then finally to keep record of all these things okay once again the sequence compliance is their responsibility for that code of conduct is their responsibility then training is their responsibility then record after training maintaining records of all the legal records is their responsibility and finally last thing ensuring proper monitoring is happening with respect to legal systems is again their responsibility what is responsibility what is responsibility of auditor first of all first of all auditors ultimate response is to give opinion whether financial statement has per applicable framework whether they are free from material misstatement that is their ultimate responsibility deriving on that it is auditors responsibility to find out whether there are material misstatements in financial statement because of non compliance of law because of non compliance of law so this is a limited responsibility of the auditor why so so this has been asked as a question why so so ask ioc indian oil corporation doctor ioc because of inherent limitations because of inherent limitation of audit process it's not possible for us it's not possible for us to go and detect go and go and go and detect uh, all kind of uh, non compliances go and identify all kind of non compliances then o stand for operational auditor generally stays away with the operational aspect he doesn't visit plant and doesn't spend a lot of time there so it's difficult to uh, find out operational non compliances of law then there is a concealment see for concealment there are concealments so again it is difficult to detect non compliances that's why responsibility is limited then d stand for determination whether non compliance has happened many times is a dicey issue is a complex uh, complex issue okay there's a confusion whether it's really non compliance has happened that's again a problem and lot of non compliance are removed from books of account they are away from books of accounts there is no impact uh, there is no visible accounting entry or effect so again that is difficult to detect because of all these reasons it there is a limited responsibility of to uh, on the auditor with respect to non compliances now responsibility of the auditor is divided in two parts with respect to laws having direct effect and other laws laws having direct effect and other laws now what are laws having direct effect laws which are having direct effect on the financial statements industry specific financial reporting requirements uh, format regulations like ird regulation rbi circular schedule 3 uh, income tax gst poga poba provident fund all these have direct impact either on the format presentation disclosure or income expense assets and liabilities so these are the laws having direct effect so other laws when it comes to other laws we are interested in laws which may have material effect on finance may have material effect environmental laws may have labor laws may have material effect industrial dispute act may have material effect that goes in other laws no now let's understand auditor's responsibility number one understanding legal framework legal and regulatory framework so we want we, we want to understand list of laws which are applicable what are the important requirements then we need to understand what is entities entities preparation to ensure compliance with this laws what kind of legal department staff code of conduct training etc they are having then if there are laws having direct effect we are suppo already supposed to check where is the compliance with the law so sit with all the important sections and check whether there is a compliance in case of other laws we are supposed to check non compliance when we say that we are supposed to take non compliance that means we are supposed to sit and do only two things do inquiry whether there is a non compliance of so and so laws and next we are supposed to take correspondence between correspondence between uh, correspondence correspondence between uh, between the client and the regulatory authorities that's it for checking non compliance we are supposed to do only two things so for compliance we check everything for non compliance we do only two things inquiry and correspondence next responsibility is to be alert throughout the audit when we perform we when we check various areas we perform various audit procedures we may get uh, we may get non compliance from anywhere reading board minutes seeing legal expenses we are supposed to have high level of professional skepticism finally it is our responsibility to see whether there is any law affecting the operations whether there is any law affecting the operations bringing going concern in trouble 
then obtain at the last written representation that management Shibri has shared all the instances of known or suspected non-compliances with us. This is the ultimate responsibility with respect to legal compliances. How much legal compliance auditor of financial statement has to do. Then next is uh, audit procedures when non-compliance is identified or suspected. That's very interesting. So as soon as as soon as non-compliance suspected, we had example of uh, we had example of uh, we had example of uh, child labor act. So there's, whenever there is a suspected, sus whenever there is a wherever whenever there is a suspected, uh, suspected or identified non-compliance, okay, suspected or identified non-compliance. Understand circumstances, understand nature uh, nature of the act, what kind of act was done, understand law rules, current concern, law rules and regulation. So understand circumstances, nature of the act, law rules and regulation. Then understand the impact on financial statement. Are we supposed to record expense loss, liability? Is it affecting going concern? So as soon as you come across non-compliance, suspected non-compliance, understanding things is important, then impact on financial statement. Then call management is to discuss everything with them so obtain better understanding with their with their help with their knowledge with their experience with their information trying to understand better impact on financial statements with respect to nature of non compliance and impact on financial statement so get more information from them, discuss with them uh, if required we can go for we can go for legal advice also we can go for legal advice. If information from management side is not up to expectation, we can go for legal advisory. Now, what could be the outcome? Suppose ultimately we are not getting sufficient appropriate audit evidence, then qualify disclaimer. There is a material misstatement in financial statement and management is not ready to rectify it. Qualify adverse. There can be other implications. When, so, this was a shock that other implications. So, we may, we may increase the risk. We may increase the risk of non-compliances, we may increase the audit procedures, we may have doubt over integrity or reliability of written rep whatever representation management has given because they said everything is fine and then we got this non-compliances. So there can be implications. What about reporting? What about then communication with TCWG? Let's understand. We are supposed to identify and communicate all the non-compliances. All the non-compliances unless it is inconsequential, unless the impact, unless the impact is inconsequential. Okay, all the non-compliances. Then if to TCWG, if it is intention material, it should be communicated as soon as possible, as promptly as possible. Then next, if management TCWG is involved, that's uh, go to the higher authority go to the higher authority you may go to you may go to promoters owners shareholders take legal advice if there is no higher authority take legal advice if there is a confusion who is the higher authority take legal advice believe that communication may not be acted upon by people to whom we are planning to inform take legal advice so go with all the non compliances with tcb unless in consequential if it is intentional material asap if management tcb involved go to higher authority Legal advice is required if there is no legal author higher authority, if there is a confusion, if you believe they may not act. Then what about report audit report? If there is lack of information, no sufficient appropriate evidence because of limitations or lack of information from management TCWG, go for qualification disclaimer. If there is a uh, inability to, uh, there is no sufficient appropriate evidence, but because of some external circumstances. Then this we need to sit carefully and decide what should be done. What should be done? Uh, if it is if this thing is properly disclosed in notes to accounts and proper treatment is given as per available information, management has done full cooperation. We may not modify the opinion, but then we need to see circumstances. If there are material misstatements, then adjustment needs to be done. They don't do it. Then we have to qualify and give adverse. Reporting non-compliance to regulatory enforcement authorities. So, 
Auditor is supposed to sit and read all the laws, rules and regulation, try to understand whether communication to any authority is required. Only if it is required by any law, rules, regulation, then only communication should be done. Otherwise, keep mum. What are supposed to document? All suspected actual non-compliances and what audit process were performed, what was the output should be documented. Then asset 260. So asset 260 says that TCWG should be TCWG should be identified and you should have a good communication with them. Now, what do you mean by TCWG? What do you mean by TCWG? People who are who come periodically for the oversight purpose, they take strategic decisions, frame policies, decide accountability, give it to the management and can go. They are TCWG. Responsibility of the auditor is to identify TCWG and communicate with them. A lot of things can happen. TCWG may be outside organization or individual. They can be inside the organization. It, there can be a situation where few people are common. There can be a situation that uh, whole of the management is in TCWG also. So TCWG is just a bigger group or it can happen that, that both are just same. Both are same. These things may happen. There can be confusion also with respect to TCWG. So we may talk to appointing authority about it. So we saw examples when it comes to individual proprietor management TCWG is same, small firms management TCWG is same, big firms, designated partners management, all partners is TCWG, clubs, president and secretary is management, governing body is TCWG. There can be common members, so president can be common uh, member between them. In company CEO, CFO, if not directors, their management board of directors are separate TCWG. And there can be MD whole time director as management and board of directors as TCWG. In PSUs, governing body can be management and ministry can be TCWG. So now what is the significance of communication with TCWG? It's very simple. More communication, it makes constructive relationship between auditor and TCWG. Auditor gets a lot of relevant information which is difficult to obtain, a lot of knowledgeable experience information and it becomes, uh, it gives TCWG a lot of information which is going to help them for oversight responsibilities. It's a win-win situation. When we talk about objectives, what are the target set? See, don't try to cram as it is. What are the target set? Auditor should first go to any assignment, identify TCWG, establish a two-way communication. So, and communicate after appointment, communicate about responsibilities before starting audit, communicate about overall plan of doing audit, then significant findings of the audit, then anything which affects audit report and so on. So, these are the targets which are set for the auditor. Let's see in detail what needs to be communicated. So, immediately after appointment, go and explain that my responsibility is to frame opinion on financial statement, whether it is as per applicable framework, it is your true and fair view. And that's my ultimate uh, responsibility. It in nowhere it reduces responsibility of management or TCWG with respect to preparation of financial statement. Generally, this thing is elaborated and elaborated and written in the form of engagement letter. So when engagement letter in the form of engagement letter, it is there. Then, so this is after appointment. So before before execution, before we start the audit, just before we start the audit, we discuss overall plan. We discuss overview of the plan. We discuss overall plan overview. We don't go in detail. Discuss the overview of the plan, overall scope, what we are going to check, how we are going to check and timings and all. Don't go in detail. Because if you go in detail, it will affect the, if it will compromise with the effectiveness. So don't go in detail to compromise with the effectiveness. Even if you discuss and make changes, preparing overall plan, audit strategy and plan is responsibility of the auditor only. Okay, and again, this is assisting is going to assist both auditor as well as TCWG. Then, once we start audit, we come across significant audit findings. We come across, we come across significant, we come across significant audit findings. Okay, significant audit findings. So, now, DAKU. Okay, so. DAKU is the shortcut. So what we discuss with them, 
D is for difficulties. We discuss all the we uh, communicate all the significant difficulties to TCWG. We are going to uh, have more discussion on it later. Then A for then A for audit matters. All the significant audit matters and the expectation to have written representation. So discuss all the significant audit matters. The, again, we are going to discuss more about it later. Right from high risk of material misstatement, high risk of material misstatement, material, uh, then uh, significant deficiencies, material misstatement and so on. We discuss all significant audit matters. Then all the matters which affect audit report. Then qualitative aspects. What is the enough number of staff, knowledge of the staff, experience of the staff, procedures, how good are accounting policy estimates and disclosures. We discuss qualitative aspect of accounting practices. Any other matter like data security can be further discussed. Then significant difficulties. So dumb, significant difficulties, shortcut is dumb, D for delays. If management is delaying information a lot or unwilling to give information, that's a significant difficulty. U for unexpected efforts are required. Unexpected efforts are required to obtain the evidence. It's a significant difficulty. U again stand for unavailability of information. Something, some basic information was expected to be available. That is not available. Then a management is not willing to help in going concern assessment. Or B, brief time. Management is not giving enough time. Uh, it, it is not giving enough time for doing audit. Then significant matters, read consultations, that's the shortcut, R for, so all the risk of material misstatements is a significant matter, all events, significant events and transactions happening in the entity, is a significant matter, all the matters which were discussed during the appointment, appointment with respect to regarding accounting practices, auditing standards, application, fees, any significant, uh, any all at the time of appointment, a lot of important things were discussed. Any change in that, that's a significant matter. Disagreement between auditor and management is a significant matter. Consultation. If management has consultation, taken consultation from some accountant, some uh, account consultation from any other accountant or accounting auditing matters, that needs that is again a significant matter that needs to be communicated. Communication with TCWG. Uh, with respect to audit report, yeah, SA 570. If we are if we are going to report on material uncertainty, 701 key audit matter, 705 modifications, 706 EMP, OMP, 720 other information. So if you are going to report any, if you are going to include anything in your report under these standards, need to be communicated. Communication of auditor independence. Now this is required. This is required only. This is required. This is required only uh, in listed companies, listed entities. So in listed entities, we are supposed to communicate with management and tell them that our team is ethic, fulfill ethical, require, ethical and independent. For this, we will uh, disclose all the relationships, financial, personal, professional, legal relationships. We'll uh, be having transparency, how much non-audit fees we are earning directly, indirectly through other firms, network firms, we'll inform. What kind of safeguards we have applied to compensate the threats, uh, ethical, uh, to compensate the threats and to remain ethical independent, that we will communicate. So we will communicate everything about ethics and independence. The communication process, first, first go and discuss with TCWG what kind, what form and time, what form of communication they expect and timing. Do they expect oral communication, do they expect written communication, structure, very structured communication, less structured communication. That should be discussed and finalized. Then all the significant audit findings should be in writing. All significant audit findings should be in writing. Then uh, any matter, independent, independent rated matter, auditor's independence, it should be in writing. But definitely only these matters, not all the matters should be in written form. And communication should be done on a timely basis. When we talk about adequacy on a regular basis, understand whether there is enough communication from auditor side and enough communication they are getting from TCWG side. If TCWG is not responding, that itself is a negative point. So the negative point, it creates doubt over integrity of TCWG, their intention and it increases risk at financial statement level. If there is no adequate communication from their side, what are we supposed to document? All the oral communications. 
all the oral communications need to be documented and then copy of written communication. SA 299 is for joint audit. So, so we will discuss uh, in initial introduction part later on. So, joint audit planning. Let's discuss. Uh, let's discuss about about uh, joint audit planning. So, it's very simple. So, uh, engagement partners and key key team members should come together and come together for joint audit planning. They should make an overall audit strategy, joint, jointly establish overall audit strategy. So joint overall joint audit strategy should be there. When they are doing this, when they are doing this, they should take into consideration preliminary engagement activity, whatever result they got for preliminary engagement activities. So that needs to be incorporated when you make strategy. What are you supposed to make in strategy? Four things. Number one. Division of audit areas, either very famous, it can be geographical area wise or it can be business unit wise or uh, it can be income expense, asset liability, financial item nature wise. Then resource planning, how many team members will be deployed by each uh, joint auditor? What will be their experience, knowledge, skills, expertise? Then uh, all the important factors which affect efforts of audit team, factors affecting uh, factors having significant impact on the efforts of the team, maternity level, audit risk, how much to rely on internal controls that need to be decided and then finally reporting objective. What we are going to report, what will be the format of the report, when are we supposed to give these reports, these four things need to be decided in joint audit strategy. Then once joint audit strategy is created, next we go for a very important risk assessment, then we go for the risk assessment. But there are two things which we do, uh, which we do before that. First of all, a common engagement letter. Common engagement letter will be required. Common engagement will be required where all the joint orders together sign with the client, and a common representation letter will be required. Then, work allocation should be clearly mentioned. It should be documented. It should be signed so that tomorrow there is no dispute among the joint auditors and joint auditors and TCWG or management with respect to work allocation. Third and the most important thing now that once overall audit strategy is there, every joint auditor is supposed to go in the individual areas and go for risk assessment. They are supposed to perform risk assessment procedure and come back and discuss the results of the risk assessment procedures with each other. Then they are going, they are supposed to decide nature timing extent of audit procedures of all their areas in specific areas and common areas yeah the area which is not divided that is common area and again they are supposed to communicate with each other so the principal thing is risk assessment should be communicated with each other audit procedures nature timing extent of audit procedure need to be communicated with each other so we had joint audit strategy then we went for the risk assessment before that we made an agreement uh, engagement letter and uh, return work allocation. Now what are the joint and several responsibilities? Let's see, we have grouped them. So first is common. So areas which are not divided are purposefully kept common. It will come under joint and several responsibility. All the decisions taken with respect to that area is joint and several responsibility. All the decisions and planning of that area joint and several responsibility. If any matter is raised by joint auditor and he says that please bring it in common audit area and if others agree again it's a common audit area so first three points are related to common audit area only common audit area its decisions and planning and agreed matters everything will be joint and several then comes financial statements so all the legal requirements applicable to financial statements again joint and several presentation disclosure of various items in financial statement Again, joint and several. Third thing, audit report. Compliance of audit report as per law, rules, regulations, standards on auditing and ICA pronouncements, joint responsibility. Then we go for separate responsibility. Then we go for separate responsibility. So, risk of uh, separate responsibility. So, when it comes to risk assessment, Risk assessment of individual area is a separate responsibility. 
अंडरस्टैंडिंग इंटरनल कंट्रोल ऑफ द एरिया दट इज सेपरेट रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी नेचर टाइमिंग एक्सटेंट ऑफ द ऑडिट प्रोसीजर्स टू बी परफॉर्म दैट इज सेपरेट सो रिस्क असेसमेंट इंटरनल कंट्रोल अंडरस्टैंडिंग एंड डिसाइडिंग एन टी ई ऑफ ऑडिट प्रोसीजर्स इट इज अ सेपरेट रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी देन दिस वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग नाउ वेन कम्स टू कॉमन ऑडिट एरियाज वी नो दैट ऑल द डिसीजन्स ऑफ कॉमन ऑडिट एरियाज प्लानिंग ऑफ कॉमन ऑडिट एरियाज दैट इज अ जॉइंट एंड सेवरल रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी बट वंस प्लानिंग इज डन बट वंस प्लानिंग इज डन एक्सिक्यूशन एक्सिक्यूशन ऑफ पर्टिकुलर प्लान एक्सिक्यूशन ऑफ प्लान बाय अ पर्टिकुलर जॉइंट ऑडिटर इट इज गोइंग टू बी अ सेपरेट रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी दैट्स इंपॉर्टेंट सो डिसीजन एंड प्लानिंग इज अ कॉमन रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी बट देन एक्सिक्यूशन एक्सिक्यूशन ऑफ द डिसीजन इज अ सेपरेट रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी देन नेक्स्ट वी स्टडी दैट जॉइंट ऑर्डर सपोज टू कम्युनिकेट एंड कोऑर्डिनेट अ लॉट स्पेशली इन फोर मैटर्स राडा राडा आर स्टैंड फॉर देर आर मैटर्स देर आर मैटर्स विच रिक्वायर डिस्कशन वेरी विच रिक्वायर डिस्कशन वेरी क्रिटिकल कॉम्प्लेक्स मैटर्स विच रिक्वायर डिस्कशन देन देन सम मैटर्स नीड अटेंशन दे आर सो बिग सो ह्यूज दैट दे शुड बी कम्युनिकेटेड कम्युनिकेटेड दैट फ्रॉड हैज हैपन मटेरियल मिस्टेटमेंट हैज हैपन सिग्निफिकेंट डिफिशियंसीज देर then certain matters need disclosure in notes to account so it should be communicated well in advance and then application of judgment by other joint auditor so expertise of other joint auditor area of other joint auditor system of other joint auditor may be helpful so these matters need to be communicated and coordinated it should be in written prior to issuing audit report that is a requirement it should be in written prior to issuing the audit report so after doing all the procedures fulfilling all the responsibilities all the joint auditors are supposed to come together they are supposed to discuss whatever conclusion they have obtained with each other share with each other and reach consensus about it if they reach consensus if they agree with each other a common audit report will be issued it will be signed by all the joint auditors if they don't reach consensus if they disagree with each other then joint auditor who disagrees they will make a separate audit report and others will make their own audit report so two audit reports will be made okay and the very important thing is yes it is not governed by majority rule everyone has its own liberty what to do so suppose there are four so one if he is having different opinion he will make a separate report others will make combined uh, three of them will make a common audit report now important requirement is people reading these reports should be aware that there are two reports that's why in separate audit report you put a omp and refer to the other report suppose that is a common audit report and in common audit report you again put a omp and you refer to refer to separate audit report as per ss 706 so people are aware there are two reports they read both the reports and then they decide what should be done assumptions very assumption by joint auditors joint auditor is entitled to assume that other joint auditor is performing all the audit procedures as per standards on auditing is performing his work properly as per standards on auditing if if the person uh, is member of icai if the person is member of icai which generally is a member of icai next he is uh, entitled to assume that if any material misstatement or any significant of observation arises that person will definitely share everything with me next we'll again assume third thing that if one of the joint auditor is doing audit of branch financial statements he must have checked everything thoroughly and properly and we can we can assume that financials and if he gives unmodified opinion we can assume that financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework giving all the information we can thoroughly rely on the financial statement we can take these assumptions we can take them if we can take these assumptions then only then only it make joint audit make sense otherwise we will uh, keep uh, we will end up checking complete work of other joint auditor and there will be lot of repetition of work so these assumptions are necessary next is communication with tcb so whenever you feel as a joint auditor that you are going to modify opinion then go to go to tcb inform them about it and give them the proposed wordings how you are going to modify even if you are going to put emp omp it should be shared 
it should be shared with TCWG. Let's say initial part, uh, initial part it was very simple. So one or more people they do audit together, that is joint audit. It can be voluntary or mandatory. It is uh, mandatory for insurance. It is mandatory for insurance companies. It is voluntary for other companies. And SA 299 tells how to perform joint audit. It generally objectives means what uh, auditor is supposed to achieve. Here they are explaining why this standard is made. This standard is made so that give broad principles on how to do joint audit, so that all the joint auditors or joint audits are performed with a uniform approach. So that to give to ensure what are roles and responsibilities of joint auditors and there is proper work allocation and no confusion in that. So that is the purpose. Then SF402, so we saw a very, very good case about it. Very good case. If you remember this particular case. So step 1, 2, 3, 4, these are complementary user entity, complementary user entity control, which are happening at user entity. Then when we talk about 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, so this is internal control system at service organization. And then the work of service organization is again checked. That is called internal control system at user entity. So, so SA402 explains, if you go to audit and you see that outsourcing is done, that means you are taking services from outside. Then, how to audit this particular situation? So, it explains, uh, it, ex it, ex it explains what information should be collected, what understand, what information should be collected, what understanding should be obtained as per SA315, what kind of audit procedure should be applied as per SA330. So, it, it uh, explains how to apply 315 and 330 in this particular situation. So, when our work or our function or our complete unit is delegated to some outside entity, it is called outsourcing. That also means we are taking services from them. So, entity which is taking the services, it is called user entity. Entity which is giving services, it is called service organization. User entity auditor is user auditor. Service organization auditor is service organization, SO auditor. Then, understand one thing. Not all the services will be relevant to audit. Services which are relevant for financial reporting. Services which are relevant for financial reporting, there are high probability that they will become relevant for audit. So, we are going to focus only on those services, not all of them. Now, they are giving examples that generally these type of services will be relevant for financial reporting, relevant for audit. Toffee service by Jagga. So, any service which is affecting accounting records, how accounting records are prepared, processed, stored, retrieved, okay, anything which affect, uh, anything which affects accounting records, accounting records, transaction records, accounting records, that is that can be relevant then anything which anything which has a in that, that has that impacts operations how purchase happen how production happen how sale happen how operations take place how transaction initiated approved processed recorded it is chance it will become relevant anything which affects financial statement preparation that will be relevant and if it which affects even how events and conditions are accounted for, depreciation, impairment, goodwill write-off, anything which affects significant class of transaction, sale, purchase, salary, anything which affects how general entries, general entries are, uh, general entries are prepared, how they are evaluated, approved and posted, that will be relevant for us. What objective set is very simple, understand the services properly understand services, service organization, find out risk of material misstatement, perform audit procedures, find out whether there are material misstatements or not, simple. There are two type of report, type 1, type 2. So, we understood this fact, it was very simple. So, service organization is preparing description of internal control system. They explain how processing happens at service organization. Then, auditor of service organization examines it as per SA 3402 and gives report. Two types of report can be given type 1, type 2. So, in type 2 report, there will be description of the internal control system. Above that, there will be a report. In report, it will be said it is management responsibility to prepare the description, auditor's responsibility to check it. He checks everything but not complementary user entity control and gives gives opinion whether description is fair, reliable, then is it whether the internal control system are suitable for the kind of processing which is being done. 
is it uh, whether the system is operating effectively so this thing, whether the system is operating effectively when we talk about type 1 everything is same except that we don't talk about effectiveness of the effective operating effectiveness of the system so let's see if we see type 1 if we see type 1 it has a description of internal control system as on a particular date then it has a report uh, it has a report report on description so it there we are going to talk about description is it fair is it reliable whether design is suitable that's it in type 2 it is again a description it can be of a specific date it can be throughout the period it can be if there are changes so description for the year or six months something like that again it will have an opinion description is fair it is suitable whether design is suitable suitability of design and is it operating effectively we will also specify what kind of test were performed on the system test what kind of test of controls were done what were results what kind of results were obtained we will specify that also so we'll get, it, it goes in detail then what understanding should be obtained so from here they explain what kind of understanding can be obtained what understanding should be obtained from where it can be obtained after obtaining what kind of risk will be there what kind of procedures needs to be performed and what kind of reporting should be done so they are saying that first of all understand service understand nature of service understand what service we are exactly taking then understand its significance how important is that particular service and because of that how internal control system have changed earlier there used to be a salary processing department of five people now there is only one clerk so what is the change then so understand nature of services then you uh, after understanding nature of services after after understanding nature of services understand what understand on which particular transactions and accounts it is having impact so understand nature and materiality of the trans, uh, nature and materiality of the transaction accounts it is having impact in case of salary it is going to affect salary account bonus account commission account provident fund leave in cashment provision for gratuity provision for bonus so many accounts and what is the materiality so focus on services first two point focus on services next two point focus on the relationship next two things focus on the relationship so what kind of relationship is there between them is it a subsidiary is it a group company are we having a mou are we having an agreement then what kind of degree of interaction what kind of communication more and more is a degree of interaction if service organization take lot of approvals lot of approvals lot of uh, lot of confirmation from the user entity then it will drastically reduce the chances of material misstatement happening so degree of interaction is a very positive thing it's a very good thing then understand relevant internal controls then understand so first you focused on services then you focused on service organization then you focus on relevant controls you understand what kind of internal control system user entity has established what kind of internal control system user entity what kind of internal control systems internal control systems user entity has established that is that is going to be extremely important that that is going that is going that is going to be extremely important because uh, uh, it is going to check uh, it is going to check whether it is going to check risk risk in the outsourcing outsourcing activity so see what are the controls to check whether whether there are material misstatements in outsourcing whether there are problem in the outsourcing so because you are compensating outsourcing risk that is called relevant controls anything which compensates the important risk that is called relevant controls so we as a auditor we should try to obtain proper understanding for services uh, which user entity is taking and the service organization also how we will collect this information we'll go to user entity we will see documents they are having so they may be having they may be having agreements contracts correspondence with service organization different kind of registers and so on that will be the source of information if we are not able to obtain sufficient source of information we will go to service organization we need sufficient understanding if you are not getting it then we are supposed to go to service organization see in the sequence of easy to difficult 
we can perform these additional procedures. So first thing is contact service organization, put an email to them, put a phone call to them, put a letter to them and ask whatever information you want. We want to know how service organization does their work step by step. We want to know about the controls at service organization. Then little more efforts, we will ask service organization that appoint a service auditor that, that have a service auditor, have a service auditor who will have a service auditor who will do audit of description of internal controls and give us type 1 type 2 report. Give type 1 type 2 report to us. Then again increase more efforts. We will appoint another auditor. We will appoint another auditor of that particular city of that particular region to go on our behalf and see what is happening at service organization. And finally more efforts. We ourselves, we will visit service organization. So, if you want information, first is we try to get information from user entity. And if that is not sufficient, then we contact service organization more. We ask for type 1, type 2 report more. We appoint someone else, some another auditor more. We ourselves go and visit them. Now, so type 1, type 2 report are superb. If you want to use them for understanding, that will give you excellent. So, their ex, type 1, type 2 report are excellent source of knowledge of what is happening at service organization, what work is being, what work is being done by the service organization. Both are useful. They will give you sufficient appropriate in, uh, information about the uh, controls at service organization. But then, if you want to use it, if you want to use type 1, if you want to use type 1 type to report for understanding, okay, ensure that the person who prepared it is competent and independent. You can definitely use type 1 type to report, but then the ensure that that person is competent and independent. If he is competent and independent, and if he has used proper standards like SA 3402, then only we can rely on the work done by type 1, type 2, the, the work done, uh, work done by the service auditor. And if that person is a member of CA Institute, then we can definitely say that he is competent. We don't need to check his competence then. Now, what things to look for in this type 1 type report? We can read this complete, we can read description of control at service organization. It will, it will be superb to understand how controls at service organization work. So it will be a very good source of understanding. Very, very good source of understanding. Then, so from uh, uh, understanding, why so? Because it is having a description. It is having complete step by step, uh, complete step by step thing available. How these guys, uh, how, how these guys process things, uh, process things. Who does it? How they achieve control objectives of accuracy, completeness, confidentiality, authorization, and so on. So that will be a big source of information because of the description of design of controls, and we'll also come to know. What are the complementary user entity control? Yes, because in this type 1 type 2 report, they are going to mention these are the complementary user entity control. These are the things which we don't check and we assume that these are checked by user entity. So, we will get the list of complementary user entity control. We will be able to understand what are the important complementary user entity control which we can check at user entity. So, they are explaining that for understanding type 1 type 2 report both are useful but be careful before you rely on them competent independent use of proper standard that is the first focus then they explain it is an excellent source of understanding why so because it has a description of internal control system and not only control that service organization we will also understand the other thing we will also understand complementary user entity controls also we will understand both the things so first they are explaining whether to rely and then two types of controls. Now after obtaining all this understanding what we are going to get is basically risk of material misstatement. We are going to get risk of, we are going to get risk of material misstatement. 
most probably will be getting uh, risk at material misstatement at assertion level. So, we should go and uh, we should perform audit procedure to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence for that particular assertion. You are going to get risk of material misstatement at assertion level, we need to perform audit procedure get sufficient appropriate evidence for that. So, we will perform further audit procedures. We may go for test of controls, we may go for substantive procedures. We may go for substantive procedures for uh, that particular, uh, for, for that, for that uh, test of, uh, for that particular assertion. And if we want, we can send someone to go and check things on our behalf using another auditor. So, if there is a risk, we respond, we increase audit procedures and we can send someone on our behalf to go and check things. Then test of control at service organization. Suppose we like some controls at service organization, we think that some of the controls at service organization are very good, they are preventing and detecting, uh, they are very good, they are compensating risk of material misstatement, they are preventing misstatements, they are detecting and correcting misstatements, the some are, are excellent, they are relevant for us. So, how to check them? So, first thing easiest is get the type 2 report, now that is like important. Do not ask for type 1 report, ask for type 2 report, for test of control only type 2 report is useful. If you want to more efforts, appoint some another auditor to go and behalf on, go and do checking in on your behalf, okay, and then on your behalf. Then, if, again now here, if you want to perform more procedures, then you yourself go and perform test of control. Easiest is to get type 2 report. Then next more efforts, appoint someone else. Next more efforts, you go for test of controls. You yourself do it. Again, before relying on type 2 report, you should carefully see whether the report is appropriately made. Is it having proper description? Is it having proper description? What kind of open is given in the report? Who, so, for who made this report, how this report was made, is it appropriate, first go and check that, okay. So, you will get lot of evidence about uh, test review, about the internal control system, but then be careful, you are not going to get evidence of complementary user entity control, you are not going to get evidence of complementary user entity control, so be, be careful about that. Then also see for that there is an adequate time period, that there is a, that there is an adequate that means, uh, if you are doing audit for one year, same time period is covered in that report also. And ensure that it is covering the assertion in which there was a risk. You are covering the relevant assertion. So, report should be reliable, that is the first thing. And you will get your requirements, but then it should belong to proper time period, it should cover proper assertion. Once this is the, then, you can also do inquiry, you can do inquiry with management of user entity that you have done a lot of outsourcing, did you come across any any fun things, fraud, non-compliance of law and uh, uncorrected misstatements, fraud, uncorrected misstatements, non-compliance of law, if such, evaluate them, we, you may increase nature, time, extent of audit procedures because of fraud uncorrected misstatement, non-compliances, you, you may go in depth, what is the, is there financial impact, is it properly taken and then according to thing what to report. If you are unable to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence, unable to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence, then uh, in, you, you may have to go for uh, qualification or uh, disclaimer. If you get proper information and there are no uh, proper information and uh, uh, everything is fine, okay. Then you will be giving unmodified opinion. If you give unmodified opinion, you don't, don't need to give reasons. You need to just don't need to give reasons, don't, don't need to give justification, don't need to refer that you have used type 1 type 2 report. But then if you are modifying your opinion, you need to explain why you are modifying, you can definitely give reference to type 1 type 2 report. What is subservice organization? If user entity is giving its work to service organization and service organization is further giving its work to sub-service organization, so that is called sub-service organization. 
that is that is sub service uh, organization very interesting now when we talk about type 1 type 2 report if they are covering activities controls done at sub service organization example being we gave our uh, salary processing to service organization and they give tds processing to sub service organization if type 1 type 2 report covers working controls of sub service organization it is called inclusive report that's really very good immense source of knowledge but then if it doesn't cover then it's called carve out report then in that case more efforts will be required to go and understand sub service organization also